Wow! What a tornado! Tornadoes are unpredictable. Back the f up! Volatile and lethal. They destroy towns. There were no houses left. They were all gone. And bewilder scientists. It's not an exact science. Every tornado is unique. Most are dangerous, and a few are deadly. This is a countdown to the ultimate disaster, a super tornado that experts believe will someday devastate a major city. When an ominous darkness fills the sky, a tornado could be on its way. These clouds are precursors to a powerful storm, a supercell. Most tornadoes form when a turbulent column of air stretches down from that supercell to touch the Earth. In general, the faster the wind speeds, the more dangerous the tornado. Surprisingly, relatively little is known about these giant killers. Scientists are literally chasing the mysteries of tornadoes across the Great Plains of the United States, better known as Tornado Alley. More than 400 tornadoes threaten to create a path of destruction here every year, far more than any other place in the world. The main reason, ideal atmospheric conditions. The mountains to the west, the Gulf of Mexico to the south, and the fact that there are no physical barriers between here and the North Pole means that we are frequently changing air masses from warm to cold and back again. Tornadoes are measured using the F scale. F is for Dr. Theodore Fujita, who classified tornado strength by estimating wind speed based on devastation. The tornadoes we'll explore here ascend up the Fujita scale from an F2 that rips the roof off a house Did you see that? to an F5 that lays waste to an entire neighborhood, all leading up to a super tornado, one that some scientists fear will ravage a major city. Nine miles southwest of Wichita lies the small town of Attica, Kansas. Just over 600 people live here. It's a town you could easily miss, but on May 12, 2004, a tornado didn't. On that day, the blue skies over Harper County fill with storm clouds. Shortly after 6 p.m., Dan Smithheisler heads into Attica. I uh, did some work for the banker in there. And I told him, his wife, I said, you know, it's going to storm today. Several thunderstorms form over southern Kansas. One look at these storms tells 30-year veteran meteorologist Chuck Doswell they might be a breeding ground for tornadoes. One of the important ingredients that produces a tornado that we're pretty sure is the wind at low levels has to change direction and speed rapidly with height. We call that vertical wind shear. Vertical wind shear spins the air into an invisible cylinder. As the wind rises and the speed increases, the tornado intensifies and the core pressure drops. Condensation from the dropping pressure builds down the funnel, creating a visible tornado. That's exactly what's happening in the southern Kansas sky. Harper County Emergency Management Director Mike Lorig gets the first tornado warning at 645. And when they start giving us those warnings, we listen and we say, hey, we need to start warning our public from there. We do not know if, if this is going to be an F0 or it's going to turn into the monster. In Kansas, meteorologists carefully follow the storm as it tracks towards Attica. About 7.25 in the evening, a F2 tornado had made it to ground 
right up here just on this hill. The path of it was right across here. As Lori watches in astonishment, the tornado tears the roof off a home directly in front of him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The whole house came apart. Unfortunately, the skies over Kansas are just beginning to brew up weather that will soon devastate the area. We thought, OK, hopefully things are over. We got emergency crews set up for that. And then it, the storm just suddenly it took a life on its own. Storm chasers tracking the Kansas supercell relay information to meteorologists using mobile Doppler radar. They report the tornado's wind speed, location, and one other startling fact. The storm is producing multiple tornadoes. It can be a very dangerous situation because often people will be looking at the main tornado and feeling that as long as they're far enough away or they're, they've taken cover, that, that they should be completely safe. Her team and others report seeing 16 tornadoes. They vary significantly in size and power. The biggest is an F4, roughly 100 miles per hour faster and with corresponding wind force about three times larger than an F2. The F4 heads straight for Dan and Donna Smith Heisler's home. We started hearing this uh, popping noise. Well, we had a, a rack of canned goods right over there. Before. And uh, those cans were popping from the, the pressure change. I can't even. It sounded like popcorn them. going off over there. The tornado batters Dan and Donna with winds estimated at more than 200 miles per hour. And that's when I got hit on the head with cement or something, you know. I can still hear myself groan. Okay. All of a sudden, you're just going to let go with it. And that's where I was when he said, we're not going to make it. And that woke me up. And I said, oh, yes, we are too, you know. And you pray really hard. The savage winds tear relentlessly through the Smith Heisler's home. When they finally stop, the couple emerges from their basement into a war zone. And I thought, where's the car? And then my next thought was, where's the garage? The twister destroyed the couple's two-story home, five barns, dismantled five cars, and killed their dog, Sugar. The terror down there was the worst part, the terror. The Smith Heislers are lucky to be alive. With estimated wind speeds near 250 miles per hour, the F4 tornado easily destroyed their home. But even the earlier F2, with winds estimated at 150 miles per hour, was capable of ripping the roof off their house. Complex physics transform air into a lethal force, a concept scientists are trying to understand. What we are trying to do is simulate the tornado as best as we can. So we're actually comparing the wind which we generate here with, with the uh, measurements made in the field. And, and the match is pretty good. Dr. Parthas Sarkar's tornado simulator is the first of its kind in the world. It uses dry ice to create a visual display of the wind inside a vortex. His machine can produce tornadoes up to four feet in diameter and eight feet tall, with peak wind speeds of 55 miles per hour. When used with scale models, He's able to replicate the damage that larger and faster tornadoes inflict on homes and other structures. Normally, a portion of the roof fails and, and create a hole in the building, which then the flow starts getting inside, which then creates more load on the, on the walls, and, and eventually those walls start failing. Sarkar's experiments conclude that the destructive force of circulating wind in an F3 or stronger tornado is at least three times more powerful than straight line winds. Since few structures in Tornado Alley are designed to withstand F1 winds, this is stark proof that even the weakest tornado is capable of causing severe damage. 
the residents of Attica were thankful to have survived the fury of the 16 tornadoes that struck southern Kansas. A unique and dangerous F-4 twister is poised to devastate a small Texas town. And later, what if a mega tornado strikes a major American city? Experts say it will happen. When we return... In 2004, a single Kansas storm produced a group of tornadoes that ravaged homes, destroyed property, and terrorized hundreds. But the power and damage of that outbreak was far surpassed by the stunning force and unpredictable behavior of a single Texas twister. Tampa, Texas has had its share of luck. The town has prospered since oil was discovered here in 1921. Today, 17,000 residents work the hard soil, farming, ranching, and refining oil. But the town's location in the Texas panhandle is also its biggest flaw. This is tornado country. On the afternoon of June 8, 1995, Pampa's luck ran out. Randy Stubblefield is a lifelong resident of Pampa. In his two years as sheriff, he's seen his share of trouble. But nothing compares to what he's about to confront. About uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we received a call that there was a large tornado was building on the south side of the Amarillo Highway, just about a mile and a half from where we're standing now. Stubblefield grabs his camcorder and rushes towards the twister. I watched it building on the farmland on the uh, north side of the railroad tracks, and it just started building, getting bigger and bigger. Meteorologist Chuck Doswell is also chasing and filming the Pampa tornado. The evolution of the Pampa tornado with respect to the parent thunderstorm was very unusual in my experience. I've never seen anything quite like it. What Doswell sees is remarkable. The tornado is almost standing still. Impossible to tell what's going on in there. Then suddenly, the tornado makes a sharp right turn. This odd behavior stuns Doswell. Tornadoes move in a particular direction because they're tied to the storm that's producing them. And the storm that's producing them moves in a particular direction because it's embedded in a wind field which is pushing it in that direction. But the Pampa tornado isn't moving in the same direction as the storm. After a series of sharp turns, the twister loops almost 270 degrees around Doswell. These erratic and unpredictable movements make this a very dangerous tornado. Let's go. And I am completely mystified as to what was going on with that storm. Then it started traveling north. Get everybody inside, because this is one big sun And hit a industrial complex. Belinda Waldrop works in that complex with her father. She isn't listening to the news. I learned that there was a tornado outside the building when my dad came to the door of the office I was in and said, Belinda, there's a tornado on the ground west of us. I'm curious. I said, can we look at it? And he said, oh, no, we don't need to look at it. We need to um, get under some cover. Belinda and her father dive for shelter as the twister slams towards them. You could hear the tornado approaching. It was like a gyrating woof, woof, just a churning that just got gradually more intense, louder. The lights began to flicker as the pressure was building, and then the lights went out. Whenever you first start seeing the real debris, the metal, the rooftops and all that, that's when it hit the first series of steel buildings in the industrial complex. 
and then an explosion. The vacuum just took me up off the floor and slammed me into numerous things and was pulling me backward like a rag doll. You're going to see some vehicles going into the air. Transport trailers and truck combination. Now, these units weigh probably 22,000 pounds empty. These were sucked up and in the tornado and were going round and round. Stubblefield and Doswell are among the few to ever film a tornado snatching up three-ton trucks. This is a massively powerful twister, one that has Belinda Waldron trapped in its ferocious grip. When I was in it, everything's dark, and I just tried to keep my eyes closed to protect my eyes. I kept talking to myself, thinking, well, this is it. They had dropped me out here into the parking lot and just dropped me on my back, and I could see the cloud and the tornado. It looked like a white ghost just going up and, and taking off. Belinda's encounter with the tornado is over, but Randy's is just beginning. One of my deputies gets on the air and says, uh, watch out, you're too close. Be careful, you're almost there. You know you're too close when debris starts coming in the car with you. I had my windows down, and, and the trash from the circulation was coming into the car with me. It's going into the city at this time. It was headed right straight for the sheriff's office in the downtown section. Well, I had, at that time, about 65 prisoners in jail. And, you know, we had a big, strong building, but this big, strong tornado. The twister strikes Pampa, destroying or damaging 200 homes and 50 businesses. Most buildings in the industrial park are ripped off their foundations. Belinda is badly injured and in shock. Of course, I was just stunned and numb. I, I really couldn't feel anything. I felt like my legs were probably broken. I couldn't get my bearings because there was no building. There were no landmarks that I recognized at all, and I was just taken back. Fearing the worst, Belinda desperately searches for her father. He was draped over a motor. He looked dead, honestly. He was limp, and he wasn't moving. Emergency workers rush Belinda and her father to the hospital. Both are in serious condition. Five other residents are also injured. Miraculously, there are no deaths. As the wounded begin their recuperation, experts study Stubblefield and Doswell's remarkable footage. To tumble a two or three ton pickup truck along the ground and then hoist it into the air, this takes incredible wind speeds, probably in excess of 150 miles per hour. Dave Llewellyn researches the strange and complex forces at work inside tornadoes. In a tornado, the wind is not just swirling around. It's actually spiraling strongly inwards. Llewellyn believes that once an object like a truck is airborne, it can be slammed to the ground by powerful center downdraft winds, then hurled back skywards by updraft winds. This brutal cycle renders the debris unrecognizable before it's finally shot out like a high-speed missile. Amazing. That was 4,600 pounds for into the crane. Scott Schiff and his team at Clemson University are studying what type of damage a car thrown from a tornado can do. We're really testing this um, roof slab here, and this was designed to be a shelter. Um, it's about 10 inches thick of solid concrete with a double mat of steel reinforcement. So it's heavily reinforced. And it's really designed to be able to take large debris impacts. Three, two, one, drop! After multiple impacts, the slab begins to crumble. So after that last impact, we now have a permanent deformation in the slab. That rebar that's down under that bottom mat there started to yield under the load. And we started to see some more concrete falling down below there. To counter multiple impacts, Schiff is designing a steel mesh net to catch loose debris. If that works, it will be a huge step forward in tornado protection. We have this terrific you know, F5 tornado. What we're looking for is that 
We are safe during the event and right after the event. Despite the Pampa tornado's unpredictable movements and incredible power, no lives were taken. 378 miles away, another Texas town isn't so fortunate when a massive F5 twister turns bits of dirt and wood into lethal weapons. The National Geographic Channel presents continues. Next, it's one of the most destructive forces on the planet, as powerful as 67,000 atomic bombs. Scientists believe a major metropolitan area could be the next target. Ultimate Earthquake, next on the National Geographic Channel. When you know it, one moment we're on the road to
The Jarrell Twister killed 27 people and changed the way experts watch for potential tornado-producing storms. On May 3, 1999, the people of Oklahoma City faced the worst F5 in modern history. tornado that went through more in southern Oklahoma City it was one of the most damaging in the history of the United States no matter how we look at the data late in the afternoon weather forecasters carefully track multiple supercell storms and the tornado reports that begin coming in at home with her eight-year-old son Dana Grimm watches the local news we had been watching the coverage for hours. He said it just kept building momentum, getting bigger and bigger, and if you were above ground, you weren't gonna make it. The storm system is intense, complicated, and growing. Weather trackers watch in shock as multiple storms produce multiple tornadoes. Large tornado, very large tornado. It seemed like just about every thunderstorm cloud that formed eventually produced a tornado at some point. And there were times when you had the main tornado happening, and then we had what we call satellite tornadoes that would rotate around it. And they're completely separate tornadoes within the same storm system. At about 625, a large tornado touches down just outside Amber, Oklahoma. Doppler radar records its wind speed at 318 miles per hour, the fastest twister ever documented. This is a monster, and it's hurtling towards Dana Grimm's home. And they had said that it was a mile wide and uh, just ferocious, and it was just destroying everything in its path. With the giant wall of howling wind just a mile away, Dana and her son hide in a closet I remember my son, he was screaming and crying. He said, are, are we going to be OK? I said, we're going to be fine. He said, what do we do? And I said, we pray. Dana's fear turns to panic when she hears the tornado strike. There was kind of a high-pitched squeal to it. And then, of course, the sound of everything, the, the windows just blowing out. The house was shaking. We could hear the, the beams in the roof breaking. The walls just lifted up, and we could feel, feel really cold air rushing underneath. And within seconds of that, the house just blew up. And I couldn't breathe. I had sucked in so much dirt that I couldn't even breathe anymore. I thought, that this is it. And um, I, I remember just praying that God it, if this is it, I'm ready. The fierce tornado spares Dana's life by lifting her out of the suffocating dirt. When it slams her back to the ground, she's paralyzed with fear. And I realized then that I didn't have my son. So I started screaming for him, and he came running over, and it was really, it was just a miracle of God because we were both barefoot. He came running over to me, did not have one puncture wound on his feet. The F-5 continues toward the center of Oklahoma City, crossing major highways filled with rush hour traffic. As the tornado races toward them, some people panic. They abandon their cars in a desperate attempt to find shelter. For a few, that decision has fatal consequences. Three people seeking refuge under freeway overpasses are killed by debris and the sheer force of the wind. Stranded cars block escape routes for many others. Shields Boulevard in Oklahoma City essentially became a huge parking lot, and it blocked people from being able to escape the tornado. By the time the F-5 dissipates, 40 people are dead, and nearly 700 are injured. And my wife worked in the hospital in Norman that night, 
and uh, she worked in the emergency room, and they were swamped, of course. She saw some really horrific injuries. People came in covered with splinters of wood, looked like pin cushions from so much wood. Awful things. Many survivors are injured by the wood and other debris spewed into the air as the tornado destroys home after home. The Oklahoma Twister leveled nearly 3,000 buildings. Miles an hour. Schiff and his team at Clemson University fired two by fours at 73 miles per hour into a variety of structures to approximate the damage done during a tornado. I think that the, um, the public understands that tornadoes are very dangerous. What they don't understand is that in typical construction, they have very little protection against those types of events. When debris pierces a home, it does far more damage than simply making a hole in a wall or door. Fire! That hole gives the fierce tornado winds a point of entry. Once inside, they can blast through a wall or roof, further fueling the tornado with more debris, making it even more destructive. This type of construction is very typical for a residential, you know, brick veneer, in front of a wood frame wall. Fire. The missile's gone all the way through the wall cavity. Most people that have this type of house would be vulnerable to an F5 tornado. Fire. Schiff's experiments determine that for a home to withstand the deadly onslaught of debris, the brick veneer must have a three inch thick backing of concrete. So this wall here would be suitable for a shelter to resist tornadoes. Most homes in Oklahoma City were brick veneer with wood frames. This common construction, coupled with the number of homes in the tornado's path, increased the debris field exponentially. Dana Grimm survived with a broken back, her son with a puncture wound to his chest. I truly believe that the reason that I was thrown twice, if I had not been picked back up and thrown again, I would have suffocated because I could not breathe in anymore. 10 supercell storms spawned more than 70 tornadoes that spring day, including the F5 that cut a 38-mile path over interstate highways and devastated several suburbs of Oklahoma City. It was sad. I think there were 14 in our own housing addition that died. And it, uh, it's a miracle of God that we didn't. The Oklahoma tornado caused more than a billion dollars in damage, making it the costliest tornado in U.S. history. Things would have been much worse if the tornado had veered just 10 miles to the west, striking the heart of downtown Oklahoma City. Even so, the Moore, Oklahoma tornado and its companion twisters rank as the most deadly and destructive outbreak in modern history. But they would be far surpassed by an F-5 striking a major American city. That would be a mega disaster, and one that experts warn could happen. When we return to Nat, Every year, major U.S. cities in Tornado Alley play Russian roulette with massive twisters that develop there. In 1999, Oklahoma City found itself in the path of a giant tornado that killed 40 people injured nearly 700 and racked up costs of more than a billion dollars. It was only chance that kept the tornado from striking downtown. Researcher Scott Ray knows the next major city to be struck by an F5 may not be so fortunate. Dallas is overdue for a large violent class tornado. Dallas, Texas is a boom town sprawled along the southern boundary of Tornado Alley. It's one of the largest and fastest growing metro areas in the U.S., with more than 5 million residents and 600 corporate headquarters. Scott Ray assists local and state governments with planning for hazards, especially threats from tornadoes. To help Dallas prepare for the ultimate tornado, he has prepared over 60 different scenarios of how the Dallas region would be affected by a violent twister. For reasons of credibility, it was very important that we look at an event that actually had occurred somewhere else. So we took the, uh, the event in Oklahoma City basically because the data was very good 
for that particular event, and we can transpose it by just moving those same geographical characteristics of the tornado on top of the geography of Dallas-Fort Worth. So we got to see it kind of from our own perspective. Ray and his team painstakingly overlay the exact path taken by the Oklahoma tornadoes over the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The ultimate disaster unfolds when Oklahoma's F5 tornado rampages through downtown Dallas. It would easily be the worst damaging tornado event that we have had to date in the U.S. Ray's nightmare scenario begins as a supercell storm forms over northeastern Texas. A 100 mile per hour tornado, an F3, touches down in a dusty field 10 miles southwest of Dallas. Its first target is the suburb of Cockrell Hill. Now packing winds in excess of 200 miles per hour, cars are tossed aside, buildings are decimated. The tornado continues northeast, unrelenting in its assault on thousands of homes. The twister's internal wind speeds rise past 250 miles per hour, turning it into an F5. Fueled by tons of debris, the giant tornado slows as it descends on the busy freeway. A clogged highway holds a heck of a lot more people than one that is moving comfortably. And the other problem that you have is, um, where do you go? Panic ensues as many abandon their cars, creating a traffic jam that traps thousands. The tornado strikes. The 275 mile per hour winds effortlessly swat cars off the highway. Anyone unlucky enough to be hiding under an overpass is vulnerable to flying debris and violent winds. Cars snatched up by the powerful updrafts are spun around inside the giant vortex then shot out at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. Next, the deadly twister approaches downtown Dallas. Dozens of skyscrapers and tens of thousands of people crowd the city. Giant glass windows shatter. Marble and bricks are ripped off buildings. A deadly shower of glass and stone rain down on the crowd below. A packed commuter train snakes through the city. Its railway cars are swept off the tracks, slamming into skyscrapers, killing hundreds. There's little doubt that debris would be uh, probably the largest generator of damage in the Metroplex. And it's basically because there's so much of it that can be generated. And you name it, it could be uh, wood, bricks, gravel, just about anything you can imagine can become a projectile and, and with uh, almost unlimited supply. The tornado continues north, leaving the wreckage of downtown Dallas behind. With winds over 315 miles per hour, it now descends on the suburban landscape of Lake Wood. The 92,000 people living here have had up to 20 minutes to seek underground shelter. But like in the Gerald Twister, those hiding in closets or bathrooms can only pray. Finally, the worst tornado in history slowly drifts skyward and dissipates. The trail of destruction it leaves behind is 30 miles long. Dallas is devastated. I don't think there's there's any way to really sugarcoat an event. It's going to be difficult to deal with regardless. So there's going to be a lot of damage. There are going to be a lot of people that need help. Total damages top $3 billion. Tens of thousands are homeless and scores injured. The death toll is unknown. Fatalities are difficult to really quantize because they involve people making decisions. And there are good decisions that can be made, bad decisions. We don't know what decision they're going to make. The best decision city planners can make 
is to prepare with multiple underground shelters and rehearsed evacuation plans. But even that probably won't be enough. I think it would pretty much be impossible financially to build a city that could really survive violent class tornadoes or you know any scenario like that. With increasing populations in major metropolitan cities throughout Tornado Alley, science is in a race against time to understand one of Mother Nature's biggest secrets. In an ideal world, we'd have radar or other instrument measurements on every tornado that occurs. In the practical world that we live in, that's just not going to happen. OK, this storm in the next hour is going to produce this type of tornado. But we're just not there yet. And it's hard to say when we'll be there. We've certainly got a ways to go. Given the limited ability of science to predict tornadoes, there is a very real cause for concern. If you wait long enough, something resembling the worst case scenario is going to happen eventually. And when it does, hopefully science will have learned enough about these brutal forces of nature to provide us with the means to survive the ultimate tornado. This is National...